To all who come to this happy place, welcome. Disneyland, a place that is known perhaps the entire world over as the happiest place on Earth. Even if you have never been to Disneyland, odds are that you know someone who has. And with 18 million people visiting just last year alone, Disney must be doing something right. For over 60 years, Disneyland has been attracting guests of all ages and walks of life to its gates. But how did Disneyland get to such a prestigious place? How did it become the happiest place? on Earth. I'm Dallin from Offhand Disneyland, and today I will be discussing with you the history of the Disneyland Resort in Anaheim, California, from its very humble beginnings as a patch of rural farmland in Anaheim, California, to the happiest place on Earth, home to cutting-edge technology, mountains, and a castle. So without further ado, let's go back to the beginning, and I mean the very beginning, before Disney even knew it wanted to develop a park. In 1963, Canadian broadcasting company broadcaster Fletcher Markle interviewed Walt Disney and asked him where he got the inspiration for Disneyland. Walt was famously quoted as saying the following. Well, it came about when my daughters were very young and I, Saturday was always uh, Daddy's Day with the two daughters. So we'd start out and try to go someplace with, you know, different things and I'd take them to the merry ground and I took them different places and as I'd sit there while they, uh, they rode the merry ground, did all these things, sit on a bench, you know, eating peanuts, I felt that there should be something built, some kind of a, an amusement enterprise built where that the parents and the children could uh, have fun together. Walt Disney's oldest daughter, though, Diane, speculated that it probably went back farther than that, to a big amusement park in Kansas City. The theme park Diane was referring to was called Electric Park in Kansas City, and a certain nine-year-old boy would always take his little sister to enjoy the attractions. Electric Park was modeled after the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago, sort of a world's fair. What the young boy saw was a magical place with distinctive architecture outlined by popcorn lights, similar to lights that you may find somewhere in Disneyland to this day. The landscaping was carefully designed and the grounds were all well maintained. The park was very clean. A train even ran around the perimeter of the park. The rides were integrated seamlessly into the landscapes, and every night at closing, there was, of course, a fireworks show. As Walt got older, he continued to visit, even until he was running the Laugh-O-Gram Studios. At one point, he turned to one of his animation partners, Rudy Ising, and said, One of these days, I'm going to build an amusement park and it's going to be clean. Later into Walt's life with the development of Mickey Mouse and the Silly Symphony cartoons, fans would often write him asking to meet the characters. For a brief time, Walt Disney considered a tour of the animation studios, but the facility on Hyperion Avenue was already cramped, and he felt watching the animation process would not be very entertaining to the guests. Walt Disney was quoted as saying, You know, it's a shame when people come to Hollywood and find there's nothing to see. Even the people who come to the Disney studio, what do they see? A bunch of guys bending over drawings. Wouldn't it be nice if people could come to Hollywood and see something. After the success of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, the Disney Brothers took out $3 million in profits to build the state-of-the-art animation facility on 51 acres of land in Burbank, California. While working on the studio master plan, Walt noticed he had a triangular piece of property south of the main facilities between Riverside Drive and the Los Angeles River. Walt had finally found it a place to build his brand new theme park. In 1939, Walt Disney asked Bob and Bill Jones from the Animation Studios character model department to come to his office. The department was responsible for the models and three-dimensional effects for Pinocchio. He told the men that he wanted them to work on a project that he had been thinking about, and he wanted it to remain confidential because it had nothing to do with the studio. Walt told the men about his visits to Griffith Park and his belief that things could be done better. Walt told them about the area of land he wanted to turn into his brand new theme park. He said he wanted safe rides, like a merry-go-round. No roller coasters or anything like that. No, way, way too dangerous. Too much liability. The two men took approximately six weeks and went to every single theme park they could think of, including the 1939 World's Fair on Treasure Island in San Francisco. The Jones brothers began to hatch a number of different ideas. They thought that the guests should enter the park through a sort of Bavarian village that would then spread out to all the other lands, an idea that obviously influenced modern-day Disneyland with the entrance through Main Street USA into the hub-and-spoke design, leading into the rest of the lands. At the entrance to the park, there would be a small train station where guests could board a train and ride it around the perimeter of the park. 
something that has obviously stayed in place to this day. It is at this point where Walt Disney came up with a very important idea that carries over to all Disney parks to this day, and that is the idea of maintaining sight lines. Walt wanted to control the views of guests by placing high fences and shrubbery around the park's borders to keep the outside out and the inside in. While the children would be able to enjoy their wonderful merry-go-rounds, Walt Disney decided that the adults needed something as well. To interest the grown-ups, the brothers came up with the idea of a mine train ride through the dwarves' mine from Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Walt Walt liked the idea, but he was unsure if it could actually be done. Bob Jones then reminded Walt of the mechanical whale model made for Pinocchio. The model was animated from below by a series of internal cables. Jones told Walt that figures in the mine could be operated in a similar manner. As the train approached the figures, they would be animated by a series of cams that were synced to a film soundtrack loop. While the park idea was looking promising, the focus of the studio shifted dramatically, almost instantly, due to the urgency of Pinocchio and Fantasia. Then, after these films were released, World War II began, and all of the ideas for Walt Disney's park were forgotten. At this point in time, it looked like Walt Disney's theme park would never be built. The story would have ended there if it weren't for Disney legend Ward Kimball. Kimball joined the studio as an animator in 1934. Kimball was the owner of the Grizzly Flats Railroad. Not an actual railroad, though. It was in his backyard, and it was really small. Kimball and his wife, Betty, would frequently host steam-up parties to give their friends and neighbors an opportunity to ride on the locomotive. When Walt arrived at his first steam-up party, he was shocked and amazed at what he saw. Walt had found something that he genuinely loved, and it reignited something inside of him that he hadn't thought about for years. The theme park. Back at the studio, though, things could be going a little bit better. Metro Goldwyn Mayer was winning all of the awards, and Warner Brothers was winning all of the box office. Disney was starved for money and recognition. Circumstances at the studio may have provided the necessary trouble to force Walt to revisit the idea that had been simmering in the back of his mind for a long time. Maybe Walt's dream to build an amusement park could save the business. After all, look what happened when he risked it all for Mickey Mouse and Snow White. Maybe the magic could strike a third time. Plus, you know, it might be fun. Walt visited numerous other theme parks, Coney Island, Knott's Berry Farm, Travel Town and Griffith Park, and the Los Angeles County Fair. Throughout Los Angeles, there were small amusement parks, and Walt would visit them all. Later on, Walt Disney would invite Ward Kimball to the Chicago Railroad Fair, a sort of business expo for railroads, locomotives, and train cars. The fairgrounds were divided up into themed villages, representing different tourist destinations and hosted by different rail lines. There was a replica of the French Quarter in New Orleans, a ranch, a slice of a national park and an American Indian Pueblo. Costumed attendants and appropriate food added to the illusions of being transported to this specific place and time. On August 31st, 1948, within days of Walt returning from his trip, he sent a memo to Dick Kelsey, one of his production designers, outlining his early ideas for something he would come to call Mickey Mouse Park. Now most of you are familiar with Mickey Mouse Park, we've discussed it on this show before, but for those of you who don't know, well, let's talk about it. Walt's vision was a park where guests would enter through a main village with an old-fashioned town square that would be a place for people to sit and rest. Mothers and grandmothers could watch over small children at play. Surrounding the square would be a railroad station, a town hall, a fire station, a drugstore, and multiple other shops. This park was very important, and it needed a lot of shops so it could turn a profit and single-handedly save the studio. Mr. Disney also proposed other themed areas, such as a western village and a carnival area. Meanwhile, when all of these plans were underway, Walt Disney's brother and business partner Roy was hesitant, to say the least, about these new endeavors. Eventually, Walt's ideas for Mickey Mouse Park outgrew the small space on the studio lot that was appointed to him. While all of these endeavors continued to move forward, Walt Disney focused on theming. He decided to expand on the system that they were going to use for the mine train through the Seven Dwarfs Mine, and what came of this was the early developments in what would soon be called audio animatronics. Walt Disney hired actor Buddy Ebsen to dance in front of a screen marked with a grid to document his movements. The movements were recorded by punching holes in a mechanical piano roll. A small Buddy Ebsen doll was hooked up via wires to a huge console type machine, and the piano rolls were fed into the console like a continuous IBM card. And for those of you wondering what the heck all these words mean, yeah, I don't know either. But magically, the Buddy Ebsen doll repeated the dance steps that the human had acted out previously. The model was dubbed the Dancing Man, and it can still be viewed in some form or another at One Man's Dream at Hollywood Studios in Walt Disney World to this day. The idea for the park was coming along swimmingly, but with more and more ideas being proposed all the time, they needed more and more space. That, combined with the city of Burbank's rejection for a theme park, Walt Disney began looking for where he would build his park. Walt first began looking for properties 
property near the studio. Walt even considered buying the police pistol range in Chatsworth, California, a site which had many positive qualities including a small brook, rolling hills, and plenty of trees. However, the shareholders of Walt Disney Productions' stock were not enamored with the project, believing that owning an amusement park was not part of the corporation's charter. And this is what actually happened in real life, I swear to you. Walt Disney said, well okay, I'll just start another company so you guys can't tell me what to do. And he did exactly that. Walt founded a new company, Retlaw, Walter spelt backwards, on April 6th, 1953. Walt Disney borrowed on a life insurance he'd been paying for 30 years and sold his house in Palm Springs to get Disneyland to a point where he could show people what he wanted it to be. With the Santa Ana Highway recently being constructed, Walt Disney decided to move his park towards Anaheim, California. There was a 145 acre property in the unincorporated Orange County area near Anaheim. That property was bounded by Ball Road on the north, Cerritos Avenue on the south, and Harbor Boulevard to the east. The site at that time was known as the Ball Road Subdivision. Walt began buying up the subdivision. One of the couples who sold their property to Walt was Paul and Laura Dominguez. Mrs. Dominguez was born in the house at the corner of West Street, then known as Sugar Avenue, and Cerritos Avenue. When her parents were married in 1896, Tim Carroll, Anaheim's first horticulturist, gave the newlyweds a pair of rare canary palms. One of those palms still remains in Adventureland to this day, known as the Dominguez Palm Tree. And with the acquisition of the property in Anaheim, California, Walt Disney's imagination was free to take hold, and boy did it. Walt Disney's original idea for Disneyland is both very similar and drastically different from what we know it to be today. When guests entered Disneyland, they would enter through Main Street USA and continue down the long narrow street to the crossroads of the world, later called the hub, which Walt Disney didn't really enjoy. See, Walt thought the word hub sounded too mechanical and lifeless for his wonderful Disneyland park. He preferred to call it the crossroads of the world. But, uh... Everyone just calls it the hub these days. At the entrance to one of the lands, called True Life Adventureland, would be a beautiful botanical garden with tropical flora and fauna. The main attraction would be the explorer's boats with a native guide for a cruise down the river of romance. Interesting. Something I could only assume was sort of an amalgamation between the Davy Crockett Explorer canoes and the Jungle Cruise which we both have today at Disneyland. Walt's dreams continued. The dream for the world of tomorrow is the factual and scientific exposition of things to come. Basically, in today's terms, Tomorrowland began as sort of a permanent world's fair, a role that Epcot safely provides to us to this day. Visitors would enter using the moving sidewalk and see fascinating exhibits of miracles of science and industry. This would also be the home of the exciting World of Tomorrow television show. Rides would include a monorail train and the little parkway system where children would drive scale model motor cars over the highways of tomorrow which obviously became the Autopia that we know today. Walt had an idea for another land, this one called Lilliputian Land. An eerie canal bridge would take visitors through the famous canals of the world, where you would visit the scenic wonders of the world in miniature form. Along with the boats, guests could take a little stacked locomotive engine 17 inches high that steams into a tiny railway station. Does that sound familiar? Does that ring any bells to you? It's uh, the Casey Jr. train and the Storybook Land canal boats. Fantasy Land, two words, would be within in the walls and grounds of a great medieval castle whose towers loom 70 feet into the air. Along with the carousel would be a Snow White ride through, a small walk through Alice in Wonderland attraction, and a fly through with Peter Pan. Which I mean, yeah, that's that's basically the fantasy land we have today. The next idea for a land Walt had was called Frontier Country. It is where the stagecoach meets the train and the riverboat for its trip down the river to New Orleans. Essentially a place where you could ride on horseback, ride a stagecoach, ride a riverboat, and go towards New Orleans, which didn't exist at the park at that time. Essentially none of the original ideas for Frontier Country made it into the final form of Disneyland minus the Mark Twain riverboat. Visitors who came to meet Mickey Mouse would find him on Treasure Island in the middle of a river and a treehouse on top of the island would be the headquarters for the Mickey Mouse Club. This island in the middle of the river though would obviously go on to become Tom Sawyer Island and the Mickey Mouse Club unfortunately does not film there. Another area was called Holiday Land and it would continuously change to reflect the seasons. Over in Recreation Land is a park set aside for reservations by clubs, schools, and other groups for picnics and special outings. That sounds like a wonderful use of the space. Holiday Land would eventually become Holiday Hill and eventually 
as we know it today, the mighty Matterhorn bobsleds. These ideas changed over time to become more realistic. Instead of using real life animals in the Jungle Cruise, Walt Disney decided to use audio animatronics. At that point in history, a new and emerging technology. To help fund Disneyland, Walt Disney signed a deal with ABC to debut a brand new show called Disneyland. It would help keep the general public in the know of what was happening with Walt Disney's park. Construction progressed quickly on the park with Walt Disney utilizing set building techniques learned from the movie industry to help build his theme park. And then, opening day happened. And boy, was it a doozy. On July 17, 1955, Disneyland finally opened to the public, more or less. Disneyland on that day was overloaded with guests. The theme park expected a crowd of only 1,500 people at the opening day celebrations. It was an invitation-only event, after all. However, almost double the amount of people came into the park that day because someone was producing counterfeit tickets. So, with the park at double the amount of people they were expecting that day, toilets were clogging, people were running out of food, and the park was way too crowded to even move around around in at that point. It looked like Disneyland was over before it had even begun. Walt Disney assured the press the following day though. He said, we'll settle down and get this place operating. It may take a month before everything is going smoothly though. After battening down the hatches and repairing all the damage that had been done from the previous day, Disneyland reopened. At 2 a.m. people began lining up for entrance into Disneyland. On July 18th, 1955, Disneyland opened, this time for real, to the public. And the experience was marginally better. It only took the park seven weeks to pass one million visitors. Disneyland was now a vacation destination for people all over the United States and even the world, not just the locals of California. As the years went on, some parts of the park closed and others opened. Holiday Hill became the Matterhorn, and New Orleans Square opened in an area that was formerly part of Frontierland. Even though the park was open, it didn't stop Imagineers from developing even more state-of-the-art and original attractions, such as the Haunted Mansion and Pirates of the Caribbean. Even more attractions opened up in the years to follow follow like Space Mountain, Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, and Splash Mountain. All of them mountains. New lands even opened up throughout the years like Fantasy Fair and Critter Country. Walt Disney himself said that Disneyland will never be completed. It will continue to grow as long as there is imagination left in the world. Disneyland would go on to become not just a theme park but an entire resort with the addition of the Disneyland Hotel. Disney would later acquire this hotel and build two more hotels on property, the Grand Californian and the Paradise Pier Hotel, with a new one coming in the future. The Disneyland Resort even opened a second park in 2001, Disney's California Adventure. This park was meant to represent a postcard of California and everything you could possibly hope to see in the state. More recently though, DCA has been losing lots of its California themed areas and becoming more of Disney's modern park. With the changes to Pixar Pier rather than Paradise Pier, the Marvel themed area, and Soarin' Over the World rather than Soarin' Over California, Disney has been shifting away from the California centric theme of Disney's California Adventure. So you're probably asking yourself, why are you calling it Disney's California Adventure if it's not California anymore. Well, don't worry. There's a name change coming soon. Disneyland today is the seventh most visited tourist attraction in the United States, right behind, of course, Walt Disney World. Disneyland means many different things to many different people. For some, it's the wonderful attractions, for others, the delicious food, and for others, the wonderful entertainment. There are things that you can find at Disneyland that you just can't find anywhere else on Earth, like mint juleps. Disneyland fans are one of the most passionate fan bases you will find anywhere on Earth. Just look at the Guardians of the Galaxy fiasco. Yikes, that was, a, that was a dark time, guys. And even though Disneyland continues to change with cutting edge brand new attractions being added in every single time you blink, the old classics still remain. Pirates of the Caribbean, The Haunted Mansion, The Enchanted Tiki Room, Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln. These attractions bring a sense of awe into every young visitor and a sense of nostalgia into every older visitor. So at the end of this video, I ask you guys, what is Disneyland to you? Is it the food? Is it the shows? Is it the attractions? Let me know down in the comments below. I will make sure to look at every single one of your comments and try to respond as best as I can. And now let's end this video with the way it all started. Walt Disney's opening day Disneyland speech. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, the man himself, Walt Disney. To all who come to this happy place, welcome. Disneyland is your land. Here age relives fond memories of the past, and here youth may savor the challenge and promise of the future. 
Disneyland is dedicated to the ideals, the dreams, and the hard facts that have created America with the hope that it will be a source of joy and inspiration to all the world. Thank you. Hey everybody, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you guys enjoyed watching it as much as I enjoyed making it. A little bit of a longer one this week. It took me a little bit longer to make, but I hope it was worth the wait for you guys. Let me know down in the comments below. Like I said, what is Disneyland to you? What is your favorite part about the park? Anyways guys, thank you so much for watching. I will see you all in the next video. Goodbye.